Um, in introducing our next speaker, I'll just call on some of what um, Siobhan said in, in, in the, her voice of the client interview. Um, when I think about our next speaker, I, uh, one word comes to mind, and that is curious. Curiosity, a deep curiosity. And um, as you heard Siobhan talking about, the, the unfolding of the leadership essence and the transmutation from the technical mind to the adaptive mind, uh, the capacity to ask the questions that others don't necessarily ask, uh, the capacity to resolve or help problems resolve themselves through looking through various lenses. And I um, and my business partners last year had the personal experience of uh, working with Jonathan, our next keynote speaker, and the capacity to be able to ask those questions and to help us see things through a completely different lens. And um, a mind that is uh, envelops the world an academic mind, a brilliant academic mind, but the, and with the capacity to be able to make things practical, approachable, real, uh, meaningful to us in our lives, and particularly in through the leadership lens, as uh, the associate professor at the. I'm going to I'm going to read it because I don't want to get it wrong. It's, just, it's the perfectionist in me. Um, Norwegian University of Science and Technology, also the, um, the author of many, many articles and sections of different books, and also the editor-in-chief of Integral Review. I would really like um, all of us to warmly welcome Jonathan Reams, our next keynote speaker to the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roma, for the kind words. I couldn't help but think about what Andrew said about how he sets up beliefs. So Roma has set up a lot of beliefs in you. <laughs> I'd also like to just take a moment to thank the Asia Pacific Leadership Circle community for inviting me here. Uh, it's been a wonderful journey so far. And I'm looking forward to sharing a little bit of my journey with you this morning. Mike Carey teaches transformational leadership. And about 20 years ago, I had the opportunity to take a course from him on this subject. And a small group of us students was meeting as a study group before class each week. These were evening classes in a master's in organizational leadership. And we were meeting here in this building. And about halfway through the semester, we started whining. We we're saying, you know, we know he knows stuff about this, and he's not telling us. We got to go. Come on, drag it out of him. So we go to class that evening. We come up to Mike, and we say, come on, tell us stuff. We know you're holding out on us. And he kind of said, yeah, well, I could say a few more things tonight. Yeah, I could tell you some things. But as the semester wore on, this process continued. And we were frustrated a lot. But what we experienced was a process that allowed us to learn in a way that by the end of the semester, before the last class, our little study group met again. And we were reflecting on the semester, and we said, we realized that we didn't have to think about what we had learned. We saw the world in a new way. And the power of gaining this new lens made a huge step in my journey of understanding the process of transformation in leadership. And so the source of this may have started even earlier. And over the last 20 years that I've been really curious, as Roma said, about what really goes on in this. 
how do we generate these experiences for ourselves and others? I'm going to share a few of the things along the way that I've learned with that. So we can talk about leadership, and this is something we've heard already a little bit today. We can talk about it in three layers. We can start by looking at what leaders do. What are the skills, behaviors, competencies that are important for leaders? And yet we know that if we only focus on those, only on the what, it's not enough. So when I started out consulting, I was very good at telling clients what they should do. And I learned very quickly that this didn't go very far. So I started to find out that it was important to talk about how leaders do things. The processes that we use that generate the what's, as well as the inner operating system by which we relate to the skills and behaviors and competencies. This mindset that's been referred to a few times. And so that helped me as a consultant to start working with clients on this deeper level of process. And yet, as Otto Scharmer has said, that there is a blind spot of leadership. And that blind spot is that the source from which leadership emerges is often not talked about, not recognized. And that source is our self, the beingness at the core of who we are, our essence. Now, the means by which our self and this essence gets out into the world is essentially our attention, the quality of our attention. So Otto Scharmer also says, I attend this way. And that is that our attention is filtered through all sorts of filters, by beliefs, assumptions, energies. All of these shape how we translate our beingness through attention into the world. And when I attend this way, therefore it emerges that way. For example, there's a lot of research in education that if a teacher thinks a student is smart, they will teach in a way that helps that student become smarter. And likewise, I'm sure you've experienced a boss that tends to micromanage and treat their employees in a patronizing way, doesn't get a huge amount of engagement or trust. Now, if we want to talk about the quality of our attention, I want you to notice throughout this talk, how are you paying attention? You're not sitting here passively listening. You are actually co-creating your own experience. So if we lead who we are, then who am I? Thought it would be fun to tell you a few stories about my background. <laughs> I grew up on a pig farm. <laughs> we had actually about 5,000 pigs. And you can just imagine the challenges of being in this, uh, as David White says, this dense underbrush of an old growth forest in the Pacific Northwest where I grew up, and having 50 butcher hogs who've gotten loose, and you're trying to lead them and herd them somehow in that underbrush. Oh, you learn a few things. As I grew up, though, of course, I wanted to get off the farm, right? That's a typical kind of thing. I went off to university, and I studied physics and philosophy at the University of British Columbia. And about a year and a half into that, I became really disillusioned. The materialistic mindset, logical positivism as a philosophy, it was very dominant there. And so I dropped out. 
And a little while after I dropped out, I was having a conversation with a friend late one evening, talking about different esoteric kind of subjects. And he said, you know, what I really want is the power to be able to bend a spoon like Yuri Geller. <laughs> and out of my mouth came the words, what I really want is the power to be able to raise consciousness. And I kind of looked and listened, where did that come from? And as Andrew talked about appearance as revelation, there was something about my journey in life, about the path that I was stepping into that revealed itself to me in that moment. But I didn't know what to make of it. I didn't know what it was about. So 12 years went by and I went back to school and I moved in closer to the Rocky Mountains and I did one of those kind of things that guys like to do. I built a log house in the wilderness, homesteaded. And this is one mountain range west of the Rockies in southeastern British Columbia. There's about 100 kilometers of wilderness behind this house about a kilometer of driveway I had to take care of myself. And in that situation, one of the lessons I learned very strongly is that you often need things. You face a situation or a challenge, and you, suddenly, what am I going to do? What you need has to be somewhere around you, because it's 50 kilometers to the nearest building supply store. And having the opportunity to have a lens that was a soft vision and I could look around and see something in a new form, see a value to it that I could suddenly use in response to the challenge I was facing was a principle that got ground into me from this experience, that what I needed was always at hand. I just had to learn how to recognize it. And that recognition came from being able to open up my mind to be able to see things in new ways. At the same time, I was commuting to the university you saw the picture of. Each week, it was about 300 kilometer drive. And to avoid having to get a job while I'm going to school, I bought myself a dump truck. 1965 Chevrolet 3-ton. And it was a great way to kind of make a living while I was going to school. But it brought its own adventures and lessons as well. <laughs> so we make plans. And in this particular story, the plan was that this was the busy season. It was near the end of it. But in about a month, I had my safety inspection coming up. And I thought, OK, I've got time to uh, take care of my brakes then. But right now, I'm too busy, and it's a month away, so there's the plan. And as you saw in the earlier picture, we lived in the mountains. So I delivered a lot of topsoil. And it was about a six kilometer downhill into town. I run this a lot of times. And I came down the hill, and I pulled into town. And I'm coming down the hill in town. I was going to pick my daughter up from the library. In the picture there, you can see it in the background. And I'm going to park. And there's a, an open space here, so I don't really have to parallel park going downhill in a dump truck. You don't want to do that. And so I put my foot on the brake. And the pedal just kept going right to the floor. And I started accelerating. And in a moment like this, you don't have time to think. As a leader, sometimes things happen. And you have to trust that you have done your inner work, that you've done your preparation, and that it will kick in. So I suddenly find myself accelerating with a six-ton load on my three-ton truck, of course. And there's a set of stairs on the building that I'm heading towards. I think, well, it's a big concrete set of stairs. I'll just run into that and stop. Boom. OK, well, so much for that idea. And of course, the adrenaline kicks in and time slows down. I look ahead, and there's a, a power pole there. Kind of on the sidewalk, there's a parked car next to it. And I'm thinking, well, I could try to run into that pole. And then I thought, you know, with this much weight, I'm likely to shear the pole off and bring the electricity lines down on the truck and don't want to go there. 
So somehow I navigated my dump truck down the sidewalk between this pole and the building. I don't know how I did it, but this is what I mean, that the training that you have has to kick in and allow you to respond in an automatic way. There was a set of stairs going up to the front of the building next, and I thought I can turn the truck into there and high center it. I got there, turned the wheel, boom, even more. And suddenly my uh, front axle tears right off the frame. And now I have no brakes and no steering. <laughs> and I'm going down, and this little uh, cement wall you can see here, my front wheels are kind of against that, and I get around the corner, and it turns the truck, and the back wheels jam in there, and I stopped. And in that moment, the first thing I had to do was, as David White says, stand still. Take a deep breath and connect with my core. Because I knew that all hell was going to break loose around me in a moment. Now, and as I sat there, I realized, okay, it, suddenly this image came to me. My battery was held in by just a bungee cord, not a good thing. And it was probably had broken loose. So sure, I jump out, open the hood. There's the battery laying against the engine. Grab, put it back in place, close the hood. By then, the police, who are actually above the library and right next door, they showed up on the scene. The fire department comes. And of course, it's a small town, so about half the people I knew suddenly walked by this corner. And everybody wanted to project onto me, how are you feeling? Oh, that must have been terrifying. That must there was all of this energy coming at me to be a certain way. And I had to really maintain that connection with myself to stay calm, stay cool, and realize how was this for me? I was OK with it. I walked out of it. Nothing was damaged other than my truck. So the need to keep our cool as leaders, to do our inner work so that when stuff happens, we're ready to be present to that moment was a key lesson I learned. I also found that revelation could come from deep inside. So about this time, I said I dropped out of university, and 12 years later, I started going back, shifted from physics to the humanities. And I did some correspondence for a couple of years. And then I decided I really wanted to be in the classroom. And the nearest option was about 300 kilometers away, down in the United States. And I went to visit a counselor there to see how could I finish my bachelor's degree. And I'm talking, and he says, you know, we have this new program, Masters in Organizational Leadership. And as he said that, this booming voice in my head said, do that. <laughs> OK. Now, this was not the plan. The plan was to become a history and English literature teacher in high school. I had all the courses designed for that. I had you know, all these plans. But suddenly, something of my future revealed itself to me, something of the path that I needed to walk. Now, what this meant wasn't clear to me at the time either. And the journey to actually walk through this path of coming to understand human nature and leadership and transformation it challenged the crap out of me at times. Because I couldn't just learn about it up here. I had to go through the experiences here that pulled me apart, that challenged my sense of identity, that challenged my behaviors and habits. I had to go through my own crucibles in order to come into a relationship with this. So, I want to talk a little bit now about some of the conceptual lenses that we want to use to understand this miracle of transformation. Right? It's this kind of mysterious thing there that it's just 
It happens somehow, right? And we could use a little more detail about that. So I happen to have done my dissertation research by pulling together a parallel track of work I was doing in the field of consciousness studies with the set of coursework I was doing in leadership studies. And I was even able to kind of weave in some of my original interest in physics. And so along the way, one of my professors was teaching us about how do you deal with different kinds of arguments. And he said, there's two ways, essentially. And the first is you deal with the logic. And you've got to be very good at critiquing the argumentation. And that wasn't really for me. It was very analytical. But he gave us a second way. He said, you know, you can also challenge the assumptions on which the argument is based. Ah, oh, I like that. We've heard this already this morning. The notion of questioning assumptions becomes a critical tool of leadership. Because if we're operating within a box that is given, all sorts of possibilities aren't present for us. We don't see that what's at hand is available. So what I'm going to look at is some fundamental assumptions in the realms of science, physics especially, and consciousness. And how have they kind of shaped our collective understanding and because of that, shape the lens through which we look at the world and how we pay attention and then how we behave and the outcomes and consequences we've created. So as I go through some of these assumptions, just notice, does they reverberate with you? Do they trigger you? What goes on? So we're going to start about 110, 120 years ago. And Newtonian physics, the classical model, was kind of ripe. And there was a famous quote that said, there's nothing really new left to do in physics. It's just a matter of counting more decimal places. And along comes this man, Albert Einstein. And through the power of imagination, was able to recognize some of the fundamental assumptions. So we're familiar with Einstein for two primary things. The first one is relativity theory. And the assumption there was that time and space are given, that they just are in an absolute way how they are. And yet by imagining what it would be like to ride on a beam of light, Einstein was able to see that no, time and space are actually relative. The world that is given to us that we take for granted is not that, it's that way because the frame of reference we have gives us a context that kind of holds us in that place. But it's not absolute. And the second major contribution that Einstein brought us was, along with others, quantum physics. And the assumption there was that in the material world, you have particle A here, and it wants to get to place B over here. And it must travel all the space in between. I mean, how can I go from here to over here without walking the space in between. And yet, as physicists were doing experiments and getting into the subatomic world, what they found was that as electrons move from one orbit to another, they did not pass through the space in between. And this great, gave them great grief. And they struggled through a lot of conversations to try and understand the phenomena they were seeing. And it led them to recognize that the world is not as we thought it was. And the objectivity of the material world is not as we thought it was. So Heisenberg's uncertainty principle and the two-slit experiment, these things started to introduce that subjectivity, consciousness, actually has an interaction with material processes. There's something going on about how we look that affects what we see. Now, coming into the world of consciousness, David Chalmers, the 
director of the Center of Consciousness Studies at the University of Arizona in Tucson, is an Australian. This is where we get our Australian content in the presentation. And he's known for coining a phrase talking about the hard problem of consciousness. So what he says, the soft problems are that neuroscience can tell us a tremendous amount about how the brain functions, how we process sensory image, how we create memories, how we learn, all many of these things we can understand through neuroscience. But he also says that how can we explain why there is something it is like to entertain a mental image or to an experience an emotion? Why should physical processing give rise to a rich inner life at all? This is the hard problem. Material science cannot say why we have consciousness, why we have a subjective life. So there's some assumptions that have to be questioned there. And along comes a quantum physicist by the name of Amit Goswami, a friend of mine, who studying some of these paradoxes in quantum physics and wrestling over how some of the equations have these things that don't quite work out. And he's going to a lecture. He actually went to a Jadu Krishnamurti lecture, an Indian mystic. And afterwards, he's talking with some friends. And all of a sudden, this image revealed itself to him that he needed to question an assumption. And that was that in these equations, there's this little sign that some physicists say it means consciousness. And others are going, no, no, we don't want that in our equations about material reality. He said, what if the assumption that these material processes are producing consciousness is questioned? What if we say consciousness is the ground of being? And it took him three years to work out the math, but he did. And these seeming paradoxes or problematic issues in some of these equations were resolved. And so a new space of possibility opens up in some of the most fundamental ways we understand our material world through being able to look at consciousness as primary. Now, this is not new. Socrates and Plato 2,400 years ago took this kind of lens or this kind of view of the world. They talked about the immortality of soul. And they talked about learning as remembering. That there was a process of revealing inherent knowledge. That what we needed was inside us. Not just at hand around us, but actually inside us. And that the process of revealing this knowledge is actually what we call wisdom today. Now, wisdom in leadership seems to be a rare commodity these days. If we look in the newspapers or we see, look around our own organizations, we may be short on wisdom. And we don't usually pay attention in a way that is wise. And therefore, we have all these consequences to deal with in firefight. So if we look at questioning assumptions about our fundamental views of reality in a material sense, of consciousness in a subjective sense, how does this apply for our understanding of transformation of consciousness? And we talked earlier, Greg mentioned, and Andrew talked a little bit about how does consciousness evolve through different stages, ego development. And we can talk about that in a basic way of, you know, how does our complexity of mind expand to get our heads around the complexity of the challenges we face? Heifetz at Harvard, Ronald Heifetz, talks about adaptive leadership. And the term adaptive challenges has been mentioned in some of the videos as well. And this really requires us not just to cognitively and mentally be complex, but to be mature and sophisticated below the neck. To 
to be able to have emotional and social maturity, to generate trust, to help create a container where people can do the difficult work of questioning their own assumptions. So when I look at this process, having studied it for a number of years now, what I see as you go along this journey that our awareness of ego processes starts to get bigger than the ego itself. So who we think we are, our personality, our ego, actually starts to become relatively smaller. And who we know ourselves to be becomes grounded more in a sense of pure awareness, pure consciousness. So the message of doing more with less as leaders today, right? How many of you hear that kind of thing? Yeah, do, do more, but the budget's got to be cut. Come on. And this tension, you know, I hear this all the time. And I, I get this picture. There's a message. We're being given a message that says somehow we need to let go of some of the unnecessary impurities. Andrew talked about this crucible of burning away impurities as part of the process of alchemy. What is it that we are needing to let go of in order to meet this challenge of doing more with less? And imagine the implications if we began to pay attention more this way that who we are as awareness is unfolding through our paying attention and listening to the world. Now in terms of the process of learning how to work with this, I have found the leadership circle profile to be of immense help because it's a good way of making an object to reflect on out of our ego processes. The dynamic relationship Greg was pointing to between the leadership competencies that we aspire to and have a degree of and these kind of reactive ego processes that are all part of us as well, and the dynamic relationship between those. My experience is when you can help leaders see that, it shifts their attention away from being embedded in themselves. So I've got a couple of stories that I'd like to tell you about this. And the first one comes from a client that was going through a leadership training program and he missed the first module, so I had to do a makeup session with him. We debriefed his leadership circle profile and went through the immunity to change process that some of you may be familiar with. It helped us get a look at some of the assumptions. And at the beginning of this, he said, you know, I'm just not a passionate guy. That's just who I am. It's my personality. I'm hardwired that way. And by the end of this process, he said to me, he said, you know what? I realize I am passionate, but I've learned somehow that it wasn't safe in some situations. But I internalized that as a belief that said, it's not safe to be passionate, therefore I am not passionate, and therefore that's just who I am. And is he was able to unpack these beliefs and become aware of those assumptions. He could see that he could use his passion when it was appropriate. Another colleague of mine was going through a process of transformation. And it often feels like a little bit of dying when we go through this. She was going through a divorce. She was going through a very difficult time at work where all the kind of roles that had functioned for her and that she'd built a sense of identity around were fading away. And she was being interviewed for a research project. And she said that, to a great extent, I disappeared as a person, I became very indistinct and absent. This alchemical process of burning away impurities is often about burning away our sense of self. As this impulse to grow within us bumps up against the limits of the kind of small self that we're in, that we feel safe in, it becomes less and less tolerable. And we start to disidentify from that. 
So this is another way where we can realize our potential. And of course, it's a scary thing to step off the edge and feel like you're dying. Because you don't know necessarily what you're stepping into yet. Now, the last story that I'm going to use, we're going to use a movie clip. We have a little bit of entertainment from Hollywood here. How many of you have seen the movie Jerry Maguire with Tom Cruise? Yeah, it's pretty popular, right? So this is a few minutes, about seven minutes from the opening of this movie. Jerry plays a sports agent, and he's the best at it. But something starts to happen. He starts to bump up against these edges. And what I want you to do as we watch this clip, just notice what kind of things are going on inside you as you see this story unfold. Then I'll come back in a minute and ask you how that's gone. So what do you notice? What do you notice about how your body's sitting in the seat right now? What kind of feelings did you notice flow through you as you were watching this? What kind of lenses did you use to make meaning of this story? Just take a second to reflect on those things. When I've used this clip other times and drawn out things, there's a wide range of meanings in relation to leadership and transformation that are present here. The one I want to focus on now to take us into the next part of the science of leadership transformation is around saying that you could say Jerry got a heart or he remembered his heart. There's something about the heart that is essential to leadership. Now, these days, neuroscience is becoming more and more popular and Yes, we are having clicker issues. We find that the study of neuroscience has gotten into leadership. There we go. There's even a journal of neuroleadership, conferences on it. And what I'd like to do now is not talk so much about traditional neuroscience, but a subfield within that, and that is the area of neurocardiology or the heart brain. Yes, click. There we go. OK. There are about 40,000 neurons in our heart, a little brain. And there's been a lot of research on this in the last 20, 30 years. And we've learned some things that have challenged some of our assumptions about the dominance of the brain in terms of kind of running the show in relation to our bodies and our emotions and our experience. So we've learned that in terms of physical health, the physiological function of the body, the heart is actually coordinating and taking in signals from a number of places and bringing it out and up to the brain to help coordinate things. There's things around our emotional intelligence that are more obviously connected to the heart, but there is functioning of this heart brain that is now understood in a more detailed way in relation to this. There's even impact that has been found on cognitive performance, test functioning in students and things. And this is related to an understanding of what is called coherence in the heart. There is a measure of heart rate variability that we can see Different emotional states produce different outcomes in the heart or brain. And this has a significant impact on our cognitive functioning and performance. We also see that this is linked to intuition. There's research in this area about how the heart is actually playing a role in our ability to perceive future events. And even research on entrepreneurialism linked to the entrepreneur's ability to make kind of gut decisions, intuitive choices. This is actually measurable in relation to the brain functioning in the heart. And the notion of coherence is really important because we talk about our inner condition. 
and that the quality of our inner condition determines the success of any intervention. It opens up a quality of space within which ourselves and others can do the challenging work of growth and transformation in relation to the leadership challenges we have. So how do we understand how the heart creates a field, a magnetic, an electromagnetic field that we can actually physically measure? A lot of research has been done by the Institute of Heart Math. Roland McCready, the director, was somebody I had the opportunity to spend some time with. And this is a little one minute clip that explains the kind of core of their research. Over the past 18 years, we've, uh, our, our research center has investigated heart-brain interactions, how the heart and the brain communicate with each other and how that affects consciousness and our perceptions. One of the things we identified in our research was the state we now call coherence. And what we found was that when we're feeling positive emotions, like we're really appreciating the sunset or really feeling love or compassion or care for someone, that the heart beats out a very different message the heart generates uh, by far the largest rhythmic electromagnetic field produced in the body. And what we've now found is that if we look at the spectrum analysis of the, the magnetic field radiated by the heart, that emotional information is actually encoded and modulating in, into those fields. So by learning to shift our emotions, that's changing the information we're encoding into the, the magnetic fields radiated by the heart, and that can impact those around us. We are fundamentally and deeply interconnected with each other and the planet itself. And what we do individually really does count and matters. So we see that the notion of the speed of trust, where does trust come from? It doesn't just come from our behaviors. Those are the most visible symptoms. It comes in large degree from the quality of our inner condition, our presence. As leaders, other people around us can literally sense this electromagnetic field that is radiating from us. We can't hide. We lead who we are. And so this notion of the role and the importance of heart, I'm going to bring it more directly into the field of leadership. And one example of this comes from a philosopher, poet turned statesman, Vaclav Havel, who shortly after he became president of the Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia then, was asked to speak before the US Congress. And in that speech, he talked about how the salvation of this human world lies nowhere else than in the human heart. And that without a global revolution in the sphere of consciousness, nothing will change for the better in the sphere of our being as humans. And he said that consciousness precedes being. The same message we heard in quantum physics. Now, a friend of mine, August Turak, has a new book coming out. And he's a businessman. He is a salesman, I tell you. He scares me sometimes with how hardcore he is about this. And he has a good business career. He was one of the founders of MTV, the Arts and Entertainment Network. He worked as vice president of sales and communication in a number of companies, founded his own startup selling software for companies like Microsoft. But he also hangs out a lot at a place called Mepkin Abbey a Trappist monastery in South Carolina. And in order for him to understand his journey in business and the success, he's looked at what are the business secrets of the Trappist monks. Operating from the rule of Benedict for 1,500 years, Trappist monasteries have actually been very successful. And while the contemplative tradition has been studied a lot, the business practices haven't always. And there's three things that I think are directly relevant from the many things that are in here that are relevant to what we're talking about. The first is that the core of the business model is service and selflessness. This is what drives the success 
not only of the Trappist monks, but there are many illustrations of teams or organizations that functioned with this kind of culture, that had some kind of leadership that enabled them to transcend themselves. So the quality of their awareness to be much bigger than their ego and their ego processes. And he also talks about detachment. And we often think about detachment as being kind of disengaged from the world. And he says it couldn't be further from the truth. It's how can we be in the world and not of it? And the opposite of detachment is actually identification. And one of the secrets for these Trappist monks and their success is this quality of detachment. They're not embedded in or identified with their ego, their role, their things. They can question them. They can change. They can change what they do for a business because the model underlying it doesn't change. So this particular monastery used to sell eggs. They had 40,000 chickens. And for various reasons, recently they changed to selling mushrooms. And when asked about it, I said, it's, it's not a problem because that's not what we're about, the outer thing. Augie talks about three kinds of transformation then. The first is a transformation of our condition. So being thirsty, I take a drink of water. And my condition is temporarily changed until I get thirsty again in a few minutes. But there's also a transformation of circumstance that is possible. It gives the example of a poor man wins the lottery. This is a more substantial transformation. And yet, as we see, there's a third layer. What he talks about is that in organizations, what people are hungry for, what gives them meaning and drives performance that is extraordinary is a transformation of being. Such as Scrooge waking up on Christmas morning. That something fundamental inside us opens up and suffuses us. And so that the old limited image of who we were that was constricting and constraining us burns away as an impurity. That transformation of being is what we live for and what can drive exceptional performance in teams, in organizations. A new book that came out just last year on the transforming leader has a collection of essays all coming from this view that leadership and transformation is related to the unfolding of awareness, the engagement of dialogue with the world. So we come back to this image. Here's the main theme. What leaders do is important. It engages the world. It makes things happen. All these skills and competencies, the tr transformation of condition. The how leaders do things, the processes we use, our inner operating system, how we relate to the skills, the transformation of our circumstances, and the source from which we lead, the transformation of being. Now, do you notice more richness to this image now than you did 45, 50 minutes ago? Has the journey we take and revealed anything for you? The alchemical transformation we've talked about today has its roots in awareness. And there's a wonderful quote from Einstein that he said, there's a fundamental question that we all ask ourselves, and that is, is the universe a friendly place? And how we answer that question has a great deal to do with how we engage the world. So there's all these layers that we want to unfold awareness of. 
And that unfolding process reveals more and more of our essence and lets it come through. And as these impurities burn off, our inner light shines through more clearly. Now, throughout this talk, I've asked you to notice various things. I have a reason for that. What I want you to do right now is just take a deep breath and notice first your physical body. Is it tense? Is it relaxed? How is it sitting in the seat? Notice the physical surroundings around you, images, humming sound of lights, my voice. And just step back from that. Allow your awareness to expand and notice what kind of feelings and emotions have been running through you in the last hour. Just observe and notice them. And then step back yet again and allow your awareness to expand and notice what kind of thoughts have been running through your mind. How have they floated like leaves on a stream, effortlessly coming and going? And who are you that is aware of all of these things? How can you let go of all of that and just be present to the pure awareness that you are? And in that place, when we think about the riddle of leadership transformation, how do we solve the riddle? The secret is that awareness works without any effort, without willpower, without ego, that spirit is always becoming more than itself. And that the inner alchemy of this transformative process will reveal what we need, that life will bring us what we need to learn from. And if we can learn to trust the intelligence of the universe, that it's a friendly place and has our best interests at heart, then we can start to attend this way. Yes. Yeah. OK. I attend this way from this space of pure awareness. And therefore, it emerges in this new way a new field of possibilities opens up. And I can't resist, abracadabra. <laughs> we give life to what we give attention to and how we give attention to it. The source of transformation in leadership is the quality of our presence. And we turn the lead of our limitations into the goal of our potential through this awareness. So we have a choice. Is the universe a friendly place? Will we listen to the messages and gifts that it brings us, to the still small voice of awareness within us? Which lens will you choose to look through and give attention to the world? Thank you. Um, yes, I, was, I was sitting there and I was thinking, do I want to respond with my head brain or my heart brain? That's what I was thinking. Um, because I'm someone who's lived um, as a head walking around most of my life. Right? And the journey's been to not just walk around as a disembodied heart. Right? And, and so what touched me about what you said was uh, learning, just knowing that that is possible is opening up new possibilities. And that's what really touched me about this. Just knowing that it's possible is giving me something to step onto, whereas before I didn't know what to step onto. So very much join me in thanking 
Jonathan for his speech today. Thank you. Thank you.